Welcome to this Discovery Health Industry Roundtable coming to you from Johannesburg, South Africa. Joining me to discuss the quality of healthcare in South Africa, I'm joined to my immediate right by Dr. Christopher Archer, who is Chief Executive Officer of the South African Private Practice Forum. We have Mr. Kurt Pretorius, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Medi MediClinic Southern Africa. To his immediate right, Professor Morgan Chetty, who is chairperson of the Independent Physician Association. And we have got Dr. Ryan Noach, who is Deputy Chief Executive Officer of Discovery Health. Mr. Stavros Nikolaou, who is the Senior Executive of Aspen Pharmacare. And Dr. Carol Marshall, who is the Interim CEO of the Office of Health Standards Compliance. Thank you all very much for joining me this morning. Let's start with teamwork, collaboration. We've got representation from different sectors, most of the sectors in the healthcare environment. And I think we've got to start with a, a very realistic question. That is, how do you feel about one another? So Michael, I'm gonna get you to weigh in here, followed by Morgan, uh, representing obviously uh, physicians, specialists in, in South Africa, and ask you, how do you feel about Quit sitting next to you as MediClinic? And certainly, Dr. Ryan Noach, who is the Deputy CEO of Discovery Health. You're asking me? You're taking the stage, sir. <clears throat> well, I think we all play a very important and critical role in healthcare. Um, but it's true, I think uh, we aren't as integrated as we should be. I think there's a lot of duplication, and because of that, possibly a lot of waste that happens in the healthcare system. Um, <clears throat> when I started in practice, I was a general practitioner, and uh, the general practitioner in those days seemed to control the whole uh, provision of healthcare. They, ch they decided which of their patients needed to see specialists, and therefore they referred patients to the appropriate specialist, and they got feedback from that specialist. And I mean, I remember many cases, patients wouldn't go to hospital unless they knew that I was going to be present, not that I was going to add any value in that situation. But uh, that was the scenario then, and I think since then, unfortunately, um, it has become more disintegrated, and I think we need to look at uh, how do we um, re reverse that trend, and uh, perhaps uh, by putting the patient in the center of the equation and saying, what is, what does the patient need rather than what do I need? I think we will go some way towards uh, solving that, uh, th that issue. Thank you, Christopher. Morgan, <coughs> can you weigh in? Yeah, um, I, th I think I'm gonna agree with Chris and, send, and say that one of the biggest problems I see, um, and we've been fighting this for years and years and years, is that we're not making any progress because in this country particularly, we have the silo mentality. Everybody's working from a perspective of the silo in which it comes in. The silos don't talk to each other. And I think that actually led to the fact that we've had duplication of care, we've had a lot of wastage of healthcare resources. Uh, also, what we're finding that if you sit as a family practitioner, um, there doesn't seem to be a, a continuity of care. We're talking about holistic care. And we find that what happens at the end of the day we don't know what the other disciplines are doing. We don't know what happened to our patient when our patient was in the hospital environment and he was discharged from there. So everybody picks up pieces, and as um, Chris said, we're actually an experiencing a situation in this country where I think the proportion that we're wasting in healthcare is really, we can't really measure it. And I think if we can get people to all be collaborative, uh, we need to look at new models where there's integration of care. Um, I don't necessarily feel that we must look at the American Accountable Care Organization or whatever, but we're gonna look at a model in South Africa where all the stakeholders who deliver care need to sit around a table and plan the care for that patient. And for me, that's not happening, and I really find this a challenge for the future, that if we don't get that vision right, uh, people like Discovery Health is not gonna do it. We, I believe in one thing, that we need to resuscitate professionalism. We need to regulate ourselves rather than being regulated. Ryan, let's bring you in here. And uh, we're skirting around the issue because I asked you a very deep question at the outset of this conversation. How do you feel about one another? 
how, how do you feel, Ryan, about the, the doctors in the room? And certainly from a hospital perspective, I mean, we've seen the statements out there, Times Live on the 24th of February reporting potential collusion between medical aid administrators and hospitals. These are the real problems in terms of relationships. I throw it back to you. I, I think the starting point is to say that there's deep mutual respect, uh, uh, but not respect to the point where we do not infringe and at times become quite antagonistic in respect of our various roles in the healthcare system. Uh, for me, the comfort is that certainly all of the stakeholders that are represented today, I'm convinced, uh, all share the same goodwill to want to fix the system, to want to develop quality around patient care with the patient at the center of the system. And that goodwill exists without question. Uh, but, you know, unlike Morgan's description of silos, in Discovery Health, we do, as an aggregator, as a funder in the healthcare system, aggregate data and interactions from all providers and members. So we interact with all parts of the system. And I guess at times we feel particularly frustrated uh, that we cannot get the system to cooperate, uh, to share, to collaborate as it should, to deal with wastage and inefficiency. I think, to, the, to your point precisely, uh, the negotiations between hospitals and funders are robust, to say the least. They last many months every year at the end of the year. This year they were so robust that they extended into the start of the new year. Uh, and there certainly doesn't feel like any collusion whatsoever. Uh, that respect uh, and that close working relationship is tested through that period. They are very tough negotiations with significant impact. Uh, and we take our responsibility of negotiating on behalf of members uh, in respect of those payments out of the member scheme very, very seriously. So it's that seriousness, I think, that is brought to the table. In respect of our relationship with doctors, it's quite different. Uh, we would love to remunerate doctors more. Uh, we think that we do remunerate doctors fairly. Uh, but doctors are, are the people who are really responsible for delivering care. And we don't have those same kind of uh, very difficult tariff negotiations. It's more around collaboration, cooperation, uh, and a focus on quality uh, in respect of those doctor discussions. Uh, I think the pharmaceutical manufacturers on my right, much like the hospital arrangements, uh, very, very tough discussions. Uh, we use formularies at Discovery Health to drive down the cost of medicines together with other strategies. Uh, and we have very hard conversations around price and volume with the pharmaceutical manufacturers using those formularies really as a recognition of providers who are able to reduce their prices. Stavros, it's been thrown to you by Ryan. Robust conversations, sir, at the negotiation table. Yes, Brian, all I can say is we, we lose the negotiations hand down, I can assure you. <laughs> um, Brian, I, th I think... Uh, Sort of as 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 Ryan said, there's a there's a deep mutual respect amongst all the parties, and I think we have operated largely with the, the silo mentality, and I think it's sort of time to have a conversation as to, you know, how do how do we take the debate to, sort of what commonalities have we got, or what what draws us together more than what divides us? I, I think maybe some of the tension in the past has been on you know, what, what's, uh, what's my own self-interest and what divides us, rather than saying, well, you know, we need to build a social compact for this country and across both the private and the public sectors. And How do we take that forward? So I think rather than focusing on what the relationship's like today, I think where I'd sort of like to take the, the focus to is how do we build on the common points, the mutual points of interest and agreement that we have and, and take those forward. And I've certainly detected in the last two years a willingness to do that. And I've, I've seen the private sector across a number of subsectors cooperate. And you know, there's something called the Public Health Enhancement Fund that be part of, many of the companies are part of. So Ross Quirt wants to come in here. He's sure. nodding in agreement. You want that support, <laughs> I, I believe. Yeah, thank you, Bronwyn. Um, I fully agree with, with all my colleagues that made mention of the respect in the industry, but I, but I do think if we talk about relationships, there is definitely a lack of trust. There is mutual respect, but we need to take the relationship to a next level to develop trust. And the reason for the lack of trust is because we are functioning in silos. Let me explain to you from a private hospital perspective. 
we in South Africa are infrastructure providers. We are not system providers. We develop hospital buildings, we equip them, we staff them with nursing staff, technical staff, admin staff, and pharmacists. And then we invite medical practitioners to admit their patients. But they do it as independent professionals. We don't share information, we don't neg uh, negotiate tariffs jointly. So there's a lack of trust, there's a lack of sharing of information, measuring outcomes. So we are fortunate in Dubai, we also operate uh, hospitals which work completely differently. There, we have to employ all the doctors. So there's a fully integrated model. And in Switzerland, we have a model that's somewhere between what we have in South Africa and in Dubai. So to, to move this whole issue forward, we need to look at a more integrated approach. And the providers must get together, start talking to one another, sharing information, to the benefit of our patients. Hasn't that already started, Carol? And if we can put your public sector hat on for a moment, just in terms of this collaboration, because I agree with Stavros, we need to move this conversation forward to solutions, and it's about sitting around the table. Well, I do think people need to be honest about what drives differences. And I, I do think that in the midst of all the respect, it is true that differences are often driven by economics. So I think we need to look very um, honestly at what are the incentives, the financial incentives that are driving behavior. However, it's clear that there then develops a superstructure on top of that that in a sense explains or justifies or, or adds to these um, basic differences. And I do think in order, I would agree with colleagues, in order to start moving beyond these self-interested camps, it's going to take leadership. No, and I think some of the leadership can leadership come from at every level. It's some of it can come Public from and outside. Private. Absolutely, it's going to take people who are prepared to step forward, and actually show what it's going to take to put the patient at the centre, no, and not not talk about it, but show concrete examples. And I do think that we are hearing some of the examples today about what it's going to take. Um, I would also challenge um, the, the, this room to think about the difference between the patient, which is a big advance on the provider, but also the population. Because if we keep focusing only on individual patients, which we absolutely have to do, we, we run the risk of forgetting that there are many, many more South Africans that are, than are being accommodated in the system, and I, I, I really would very much support the focus on the patient, but it needs to be placed in context. Um, and in let's pause there for a moment because Morgan wanted to make a comment and Kurt, I'll come to you in a second on putting the patient at the centre. Mm -hmm. I just want to take up what Carol said. I want to move one step further. I think Margaret Chan made a statement at the WHO that we should actually move away from patient-centred care. Mm -hmm. Because if we endorse that, we're actually reacting to the system when the patient gets sick. Right? I think we should be moving to person-centered care and population health care because if we keep the patient healthy, it's going to have a positive effect on the economy, positive effect on health care generally. But I think our health care system in this country has been developed on being reactive and very curative. So we wait for people to get sick, and then we want to implement change. It's not going to happen. So just to advance what Carol said, I would say, I would talk about patient-centered care and population health care. And I think if we can move in that direction, we're probably going to have better health care outcomes. Person-centered health care, that's great, because we're talking about preventative medic medication here, which is the way that we need to go as an economy to impact costs positively in the environment. Quit. I want to add, I want to take that one step further. I, I fully support what, what Carolyn and Morgan said, but, but we want to take it one step further, because in the private sector, if you talk about patient centricity, it will remain Patients at the centre, doctors first. We've changed our thinking. We all have to talk about patients first. And that's the approach that we need to follow so that we can all cooperate and work together as co-providers 
in the interest of patients. When you talk about putting the person at the centre of the healthcare system, it goes back to the discussion on outcomes, on monitoring yes. uh, the process and monitoring the doctors and the hospitals. How far are we that, from that as, as a real life uh, environment for healthcare in South Africa? Well, I think this is one of the big challenges because how do you measure outcomes? Um, you know, if you can't measure something, you can't manage it. And what, what are the endpoints that we, we are concerned with? Obviously, one is life or death. I mean, does a patient live at the end of a procedure or die at the end of a procedure? And one can measure those outcomes fairly easily. But when it comes to quality, I mean, what are the, what are the actual endpoints that we need to be focusing on? And I think that's where some of the difficulty arises. Because obviously, I mean, if you, if you depends on the, on, on the patient as well. I mean, a lot of older patients have a, a multitude of uh, maladies that affect them. So how do you assess and measure those patients in terms of outcome and, and, and the treatment that they are afforded? Um, so it's a let, quite a complicated issue. Let's get Ryan in issue. here in terms of, I'm sure you've got some solutions on the, the monitoring process. Well, part of the journey towards measuring outcomes is firstly starting with perceptions. And there's good evidence particularly coming out of the US which shows that patients' perceptions of hospital care are a good proxy and a reliable reflection of the actual quality received in a particular hospital. So at Discovery Health we've been asking patients to tell us in a 24 question questionnaire survey uh, after admission to a hospital about their perceptions of that hospital care and have aggregated over three years quite material data about that. So on the journey towards measuring outcomes, that's certainly an important first step. The trick in measuring outcomes, which Chris was alluding to, is it needs to be case mix adjusted. What this means is that uh, an appendicectomy at one hospital may not easily be compared to an appendicectomy at another hospital if the first is a young, healthy person and the second is an elderly person with three chronic diseases. Uh, the outcome of that clinical intervention can't really be fairly compared. And at Discovery Health over years, we have adopted various uh, case mix adjustment methodologies, which we think create parity in these comparisons. Once there is parity in the comparisons, then outcome measures can be provided. Uh, the key issue, though, is that it needs to be done in an environment of trust. And Kurt was talking about trust earlier. Uh, the providers around whom these are being reported need to trust the methodologies need to trust the data set and need to support this approach towards publishing the outcomes. Uh, if one does Ryan, it as a I'm going to stop you there. We're going to debate this further, but I want to take one step back because isn't technology central to the record process, to the sharing of information? And I, I just want to take that step back, Morgan. I know you wanted to come in. But technology, and, and Stavros, maybe you can give me some insight, you know, having spoken extensively at the World Economic Forum. Surely technology, as was set out by Dr. Jonathan Broomberg earlier, the CEO of Discovery Health, is the disruptor that can completely change the operating of all stakeholders within the health sector. So I, I think, Bronwyn, uh, sort of in, in, our, in our context, the pharmaceutical industry, I think we've moved very clearly out of, a, out of an industrial phase into a digital phase. It's a digital quasi-new technology phase. And, and I think that is a huge disruptor because you are starting to see patients becoming directly involved in terms of the therapeutic interventions that they require. But there's also you know, a, a good aspect to that in, in that it does lead, lend itself towards better patient care. Or it starts personalizing things and you can certainly have a more erudite discussion with your, with your physician or whoever it is that, you, uh, that, that you're calling on. But I think what it also has done, and uh, Dr. Broomberg, when he spoke earlier, raised this, it, it has introduced new technologies that are very specialized or tailor-made for specific patients. And, and with that comes quite an extensive price tag. And so here's a question for us, for us as an emerging economy. How do we access those new technologies given the price tags that exist? And I, I think as a country, we've got a track record, and certainly my company, Aspen, you know, we we're faced with the same dilemma with ARVs 12 years ago, just $25,000 per patient per year. And we were able through technology transfer arrangements and licensing arrangements, we were able to bring the cost down quite dramatically and also not disrupt other more sort of 
important market for, for the licensors. So I think there is that balance we can, we can do all of that with technology. Carol, I, I know you want to weigh in here, but I still want to stay with this technology theme because I'm actually taking it back to basics. I'm saying that the starting point is really a communication system across all stakeholders where that input is visible to you all. So if a patient monitors a doctor or a hospital, that information, given that we've, we've moved beyond the trust discussion now, we're saying you all trust one another, let's, let's take that as a given, because we have to trust one another, you all have access to that information. <coughs> Carol, staying with technology mm -hmm. in the public sector. Mm -hmm. I just want, to want us to remember that we have clinics and even hospitals in this country where they can't tell you how many patients they've seen. Exactly. They can't tell you how many people were on duty that day. They can't tell you how many aspirins they should or should not have. So if we're going to talk about technology, I wanted to recall what Ryan said earlier. Is this not an area where we need to look at leapfrogging? Because I can tell you at this moment in the public sector, it, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. People don't know how much work they're doing, they don't know how much money they're spending, they don't know, how, let alone measuring outcomes. I mean, let's start measuring throughput first. How do we leapfrog? Exactly right. Just let's start with the number of patients that are being examined within the country and living and dying. But the, the health record that you talk about is a fundamental quality intervention that anecdotally and in data from overseas has made dramatic enhancements in the quality of care. And empowering a physician with all of the data relating to a particular patient that they're seeing is uh, you know, unquestionably and of course intuitively helpful. I can tell you as clinicians, seeing an elderly patient who tells you that they're taking the little pink pill and the triangular yellow pill is frustrating because it would be useful to have the full medical record and pharmaceutical record in front of you. At Discovery we've been on a tough journey to be honest over the last two years and now I have about 1400 doctors in South Africa who use our electronic health record system, Health ID, every single day in their practices. We have about 4,000 doctors that are, have used it, but only 1,400 that are using it regularly. And we are seeing multiple anecdotes and some evidence of the value of this from a quality perspective. The journey has been really tough, and it's the trust issue. We, for a long time, uh, were in an extended conversation, for example, with pathologists. We've got some of them in the room here today. Uh, to give them the comfort and the trust that our intent is solely to try and drive up quality by empowering physicians with a full set of data uh, and therefore to get the pathologist to provide the detail of pathology results so that it can feature inside this health record. And I can gladly tell you today we've, we've crossed that bridge. Christopher, how would this change your life? Picture a system where you can go in and know the entire patient history of the person sitting in front of you. Look, I, I agree with Ryan. I think uh, undoubtedly the future is an electronic patient record system, but it has to operate off a single platform. You can't have multiple systems out there for multiple funders. Somehow we've got to move from the, the, the current model where clearly the uh, Discovery ID, Health ID system is working within the constraints of Discovery Health. We've got to spread it across the industry. I mean, uh, I, I wouldn't like to be faced with a situation of having to put in place a whole range of uh, similar technologies to cover the full spectrum of patients that I see. So there, we, there needs to be a mechanism, uh, and it's got to be an industry-wide mechanism, of moving to a single platform uh, with a single set of uh, criteria that uh, everybody will buy into. Now, I, I'm not a technologist in that sense, so I don't know how, you know, how achievable it is, but I think Judging from what uh, one reads, uh, technology is increasing at an exponential rate and the costs are co continually coming down. So I think it should be within the, the ambit of affordability within the very near future if we all focus our minds. Quit, uh, <coughs> one more comment on, on technology and, and I think we've identified low-hanging fruit, widespread investment from public, private mm. sector, mm. NGOs into technology in healthcare in South Africa could transform, Ryan, as you've pointed out, record keeping mm. when it comes to patients. A very good starting point. Quit. Bradman, I think it definitely can. Uh, technology is, is extremely complex and you have to look at it from different perspectives. Firstly, if you look at service delivery, Johnny pointed out uh, the example of the expensive uh, drug for, for cancer treatment. Now, 
Over years, many technologies developed to such an extent that treatment is now possible for patients that was not possible before. So it has a very positive impact on, on our ability to treat patients, but it adds cost to the system. Secondly, when you talk about managing hospitals and doctor practices and, and even from a funding perspective, obviously it is the most important enabler to inform all players in the industry about patient care. But then we need to share a platform where we gather all the information and the same information that's available to us as hospitals should also be available to the treating doctors. You've all spoken about breaking down the silos and collaborating with one another. And I just want to pause here for a slight anecdote. As the mother of a five-year-old uh, little girl uh, who was recently diagnosed with um, hypermetopia, which is an eye condition, I didn't know where to go. So I started and, and I went off to the ophthalmologist and I got a diagnosis. I didn't get the outcome because th this is what's interesting me now is that if you somebody says to you this is where you are potentially going to go or this is where other people have gone in a diagnosis you know how to treat it. I wasn't satisfied with the initial specialist and I went through to another ophthalmologist and then an orthoptist and then an optometrist mm -hmm. and when we talk about these silos that's what I experienced and at the end of it the the different diagnosis that I got from each individual specialist really confused me. And that's the reality. So suddenly I took it into my own hands and decided that Google was my best friend and that I would put forward my own treatment. But I think that, you know, when we try and talk about it, I just want to say that that's the anecdote. That's what's happening to people out there. And uh, I do, uh, I'm with uh, Discovery Medical Aid, so the onus was on the, the medical aid to respond to all my specialist bills when they, they came to, to fruition. So that, I think, is the example. Now, how do we get everybody to work together because I like this outcomes value-based healthcare system and, and I think we've got pockets of it, Ryan, as you've alluded to in South Africa, where if there was a complete eye care center where you had everybody in that value chain and my employer, CNBC Africa, encouraged me or gave me incentives to visit the best eye care specialist in the country. So it goes right through to business endorsing uh, this multidisciplined environment. Is that making sense to you? Is that what we're talking about as value-based? I go it, it, to it, one it, center? It, it certainly is. Uh, it's, uh, it's an integrated care model. Um, which has been demonstrated to have def better outcomes. And I think as a patient, you'd be much more comforted if you had a team of people, multidisciplinary, debating your, your problem. You know, it does exist uh, in small pockets, and we wish that it existed more cohesively. But just down the road, there's a, a breast cancer surgery unit where the breast cancer surgeon and fellow breast cancer surgeons, plastic and reconstructive surgeons who deal with the aesthetic outcome, oncologists who deal with the chemotherapy, radiotherapists who are delivering radiotherapy, the anesthetists who are delivering the care, psychologists around the, so the social and psychosocial issues, they all meet. And pharmacists who and are pharmacists, they through They all the meet around the table together, almost daily, I think it is daily. They meet daily, they discuss every case, they review every diagnosis, and I've left out the radiologists and pathologists who are in that room too. They review the pathology, they discuss the radiology, they talk about the surgical approach, they understand the aesthetic outcome, they plan the care, uh, you know, holistically. And as a patient in that system, I think the patient truly is at the center of the system um, with a multidisciplinary approach. There are a number of sites which are delivering, delivering that kind of excellence. Uh, to break down the barriers from solo practice to get to that integrated environment, uh, is tough and we need to work harder at it. But Carol, then I'm one of the privileged few, I think the 15% of the population that has medical aid at my disposal right. and I can walk into five different specialists and fund the shortfall myself. Mm -hmm. The majority of the population mm -hmm. aren't anywhere near there. In fact, getting to a hospital in a rural environment mm -hmm. is near impossible in some instances. Mm -hmm. Is this whole value-based healthcare system just too far stretched for the public health care environment that we're dealing with in South Africa, and we've got too much right now to just sort primary health care out. I do think we need to focus on primary care, <coughs> and I would add that I think the private health care industry also needs to focus on primary care, um, and not just on the high-level secondary or tertiary level care. 
Um, so I do think that there is learning in both directions. I think what Ryan has just described as integrated care is something that the public sector could really benefit on, benefit from. It wouldn't look the same, but perhaps the principles are transferable. And so I would challenge people who are developing innovative models, no, models in the private sector to bear in mind that they're not replicable exactly as they are developed, but perhaps there are principles and learning that could be transferred into the public sector uh, and, and, and it find expression in a different way. And perhaps that expression in turn could feed back into the private sector because the public sector can't deal with virtually unlimited money. They can't. They have to take decisions on what is best for the greatest number of people. And I think that in a sense, perhaps South Africa's private healthcare industry, because it doesn't have that constraint or in a different way, perhaps doesn't bring as much of that value to the table as they could be doing. Morgan? The good news about that breast cancer surgeon is that she also leads breast cancer surgery at Baragwanath Chris Harney Hospital, mm -hmm. so uh, it is shared. So certainly skills transfer from yeah. private to public sector, which gets a big thumbs up on this uh, discussion where we're talking about collaborative action in the healthcare environment. Morgan, you wanted to come in here. Yeah, you know, oh, I think uh, I agree with, with, with hospital outcomes and, and, and the theory that we discussed, but there's a reality. So we need to step back a bit. The first reality is that in primary care, mm -hmm. we've actually seen the introduction of um, of, exam uh, of measuring outcomes. Now, doctors don't buy into this, and I'll tell you why they don't buy into it. We're using a proxy measure to measure outcomes because we can't real measure outcomes and the kind of data we get in. Maybe with the discovery system, we're gonna get better data in. So that's one issue. Secondly, we, have, we don't have a common platform. So each medical scheme in this country, each administrator has got his own actuarial set own accounting, own clinical advisors, and when we risk adjust, every scheme is risk adjusting differently. So you have a doctor who practices exactly the same, we measure him, we all subscribe that we should measure, otherwise it's no point going into value-based uh, healthcare if you can't measure. But what happens is the doctor is found to be a good doctor in one scheme and a bad doctor in another scheme when he's actually practicing exactly the same medicine. So the first thing I would say is, if we want to have an integration, I would think that the, the, the administrators and schemes should come together to say, how are, we, how are we going to do this so that we get a picture that reflects exactly how a doctor... Are you saying awarding quality, awarding good performance? Yes, yeah, if you're going to reward good performance, you can't be rewarded by one system or another. So the reason why we're not rewarding uniformly is because each one is doing his own and we're not talking to each other. Comes back to the problem of silos. And then we go back to, we want to talk about population health and a whole other thing we want to measure. I think one of the uh, examples of the market is the theory by the Institute of Medicine in America where they're using this, the concept called the triple aim theory. And in the triple aim theory, what you're actually measuring is three legs to it. The first leg is you're measuring patient experiences, and we heard about this today, uh, what experience the patient has in the healthcare system. And I think those questions and surveys mustn't be, how long do you wait with your doctor? Is your doctor smiling at you? It needs to be realistic questions about, are you benefiting I from love my the doctor to smile at me. It always yeah. makes me feel much better. Yeah, Good then, bedside but, manner goes but a long way. But the only one that's paying him to smile at you. Ag but, agreed. <laughs> agreed. We don't want wastage on yeah. smiles. Yeah. So I think that that's the, we need to measure patient experiences. So it'll, we'll have to go into a thing called patient surveys. We're also going to do a population health survey, which is the second leg, to see is that population where the patient comes from benefiting from that interaction is that. And I think the last component is cost per capita. Right? But I think the problem in South Africa and why we're not shifting adequately, our entire healthcare system until the disruptive kind of work by Discovery and a few people has been focused on managing cost, not managing quality. Mm -hmm. So I think this leapfrog that um, Ryan spoke about, about going ahead, it's a huge thing, it's gotta be evolutionary, but we've got to get there and we've got to sell to the doctors. How it's do you get the doctors to buy into it? I, I know that you wanted to, to come in here. Quite, sorry, I know we've got, we're yeah. just uh, cognizant of time. Mm -hmm. How do we get doctors to buy into value-based healthcare? Well, if I, I, I think some of the, the industry is actually doing it properly, right? We have 
a lot of the administrators now creating forums where the leadership interacts at the forums. We take that kind of thing back to the to the to the doctor. But the mindset of a doctor is that, yeah, I'll buy value if I get rewarded for it, mm -hmm. right? So we're going to actually go back and tell them what value is. And I said in my opening statement, doctors have this funny notion that they're going to work harder and harder and harder, and you're going to get paid less and less and less. But I want to go back to one more item and say why it's hard to sell it. It's very hard to sell it because if we look at the new kind of patient coming into the healthcare industry, it's a low contributing patient who contributes very little. So we have bigger volumes of people that are paying less. The traditional models are dropping. So for the doctors to survive is actually having to see more and more patients almost like an assembly plant line. Now. What, I, want what to, I want Kurt to, to come yeah. here, so Morgan, so can I just quickly get no. you to wrap up your thought yeah. process there? Okay. I think what doctors feel is that it's counterintuitive to ask me to do more and more and more work and then want me to produce quality. Mm -hmm. So we're going to sell this to them, that they're going to work smarter and they're going to work better. Mm -hmm. 100%. Yeah, Brandon, we see a leadership role for the private hospitals to play. I, I agree with Morgan. I've been working in this industry now for 25 years. During the initial years, the biggest excitement every year was the annual tariff negotiations that we did at an industry level. We went to the RAMS offices, we had coffee together, decided on the <laughs> increase for the next year and went home and the excitement was over for the year. So we've now uh, reached a stage where we, I think we all agree we have to look at value. We can't only look at cost, but we can't only look at quality either. We, we have to look at the value equation encompassing both quality and cost. Secondly, we have agreement that we should move away from our siloed approach. Now, how do we do that? What we did, for instance, was starting by sharing information. We benchmark all our hospitals and we benchmark all our supporting doctors. We have data on the quality and cost profiles of all our supporting doctors. And there is a lot of variance, unfortunately, in the outcomes and the cost component. But now, every quarter, we give our <coughs> supporting doctors a report so they can see where they lie in terms of the peer group within MediClinic. And most doctors, like most people, don't want to be outliers for the wrong reasons. So if a doctor sees that, look, um, I'm taking longer in theater, my pharmacy bill is higher than the bill of my colleagues, they will proactively start managing that going forward. So the first way to integrate is to start sharing information. Information is extremely powerful. And then as a next step, we meet with our colleagues at Discovery and we share and we compare and we say, do you have the same view on the quality at MediClinic than what we have, and that's how we take the process forward. <coughs> Christopher, a comment from you in getting yeah. doctors to buy <coughs> into what Quit is proposing? I think the integrated he healthcare model is not new. You know, if we think back to grand rounds when we were, we, we, we were medical students, I mean, you would have the, the radiologist, the pharmacist, the pathologist, all the ancillary uh, providers of care present on those grand rounds. Now, how do you structure that sort of system in a, in a private sector where everybody is gainfully employed all of the time? Because otherwise you're gonna get a lot of wastage. One of the ideas that uh, was mooted a number of years ago was group practice without walls. And whereas it, you, you could actually integrate a lot of the um, services that, that link doctors, the, the administration services, the, the billing services, and those sort of things in a common system. Um, but I think one needs to move beyond that. And really, one needs to, I think if one's thinking logically about it, one needs to move doctors into purpose-built medical centers. And unfortunately, I think the private hospitals provide facilities for individual doctors, so they, they are perpetuating the, the concept of the solo practitioner. There are a few practices where they have managed to overcome those difficulties and have set up group practices. But we really need to look beyond that as well to go to an integrated multidisciplinary group practice arrangement. And that's the challenge going forward. 
So just to <coughs> recap at this stage, we are 15 minutes out from a closure on the broadcast, but we've spoken about the importance of technology in the healthcare environment. We've spoken about record keeping where patients are concerned as central to a healthy functioning healthcare environment. We've spoken about the monitoring of performance when it comes to doctors and hospitals. We've spoken about the importance of trust and collaboration. There's another burning issue I want to bring to the fore. Ryan, you alluded to it in your earlier presentation, and that is reimbursements um, when it comes to this value-based systems if you can weigh in. In the US, uh, <coughs> Medicare, uh, who funds uh, you know, the care for those that can't afford it, uh, withholds 3% of all hospital payments uh, and puts that into a quality pool. Uh, that 3% is then dispersed later on during the cycle based on the quality metrics and quality performance of the various hospitals in the system. Hospitals that perform well, whose quality is above average, uh, and these are very simple quality measures that have been agreed. Those hospitals whose quality performs above average take the lion's share of that 3%. Uh, those hospitals whose quality is below average take none or very little of the 3%. And so there is a financial incentive inherent in the system to deliver quality. Uh, and this has triggered a domino effect and a range of different events where quality is suddenly at the forefront of the economic mindset and is manifesting in the way that care is delivered. We have some examples in South Africa too where at Discovery Health we've tried to uh, incentivize good quality um, and use you know, the economics, the fact that we, we disperse members' money to do this. Uh, it definitely is the way of the future. We should no longer be paying for production, for quantity. We should definitely be paying for quality. The misuse of resources is another theme that we need to touch on. And uh, perhaps, Carol, you can come in here. Just in terms of, and I'm talking about a patient going into a hospital and having an MRI, a CAT scan, et cetera, et cetera, to define ultimately what is wrong with them at the end of the day. Is there not a way to reduce pot potentially the money spent on the process that they follow to coming through to the diagnosis? Does that make sense to you? Well, I mean, I, I think we've heard the answer. It's about payment schemes. It's about incentives that are based on people, on person-centered care, not driven by a fee-for-service model. And I think as long as people are paid for doing more work, they will find work to do. You know, I mean, I think that's, in a way, you could bemoan that and say perhaps human beings should be different, but I do think that it's going to take a reform in terms of both regulation and payment mechanisms. Uh, and I think if we're skirting around that, we, we are, it, we're go it's going to come to it one day. No, uh, uh, but I don't think we must underestimate that, that is, it's not going to be easy. I mean, I think we saw what happened in the United States. No, it's not going to be easy. And well, we perhaps go, it's not we can learn easy. from some of what did happen there about what, what can be the steps along that pathway. Well, I think uh, Bronwyn, the most important challenge is that this remuneration that Ryan described, which we fully support in principle, should not be done in silos once again. You can't remunerate hospitals for hospital quality and you can't remunerate doctors for doctor quality because our associated doctors, they are our partners, they treat their patients, our patients in our facilities. So we have to move towards a dispensation of global fees where funders pay for an episode of care. That will give uh, an incentive to us as providers to work together because we have to manage in that episode of care the quality as well as the cost optimally. And we can only do that if the incentives are aligned. But the regulatory environment currently is prohibiting us from doing that. Doctors in our country are not allowed to share fees, not even with one another, let alone with hospitals. And if we share fees with hospitals, we are accused of uh, perverse, uh, sharing perverse incentives with fees. But all over the world, payment mechanisms are moving towards global fees. In Switzerland, we get one uh, DRG fee for an episode of care 
and we sit around the table with our supporting doctors and we divide the income between the hospitals, the radiologists, the pathologists and the doctors. Stavros, you were quite outspoken about regulation. Uh, perhaps you, you want to come in at this point? Yeah, I, I think just a very brief comment. I think as long as we're incentivizing the right type of behavior, because it's also, you know, you can also cloud issues and, and land up having incentives that incentivize the wrong type of behavior and the wrong outcomes. So it's, it's got to be clearly leveled at, you know, achieving the right outcomes. I want to move to closing comments uh, across the panel now. Uh, Michael, before we do that, I'm sorry, Michael, I'm, I'm wanting to refer to you as Michael Porter, the, <laughs> the Harvard professor that I've been reading about all evening and all his documentation. Christopher, before we move to clo closing comments, you indicated you wanted to make a statement there, and then we will start, Carol, on your side with closing comments, just in terms of your final thoughts that you would like to leave the room and certainly our broadcast audience with on healthcare, the quality of healthcare, and the solutions. Yes, I just wanted to make a point about global fees. I think global fees work well if, you, if you're dealing with a complex patient with, with needs multiple levels of care with different health care providers. But a lot of health care involves simple issues which is solved simply by a single intervention with a single provider. So I think in that, obviously, that setting, a global fee for that sort of interaction would not be appropriate. And uh, I, I, I don't know what the statistics are, but I'd guess that that represents probably the majority of healthcare interventions that take place. Um, so, I, you know, I just think there, there, there obviously clearly must be a move towards global, global, global fees for the more complex problems, particularly pa where patients are admitted to hospital. But a lot of care takes place out of hospital and it's simple care and uh, we need a, I think the, the fee for service system is a much maligned system but I think it still has a role in that sort of uh, environment. Closing comments, as I set out earlier, on the quality of healthcare and improving the quality of healthcare in South Africa. To borrow again from Dr. Jonathan Broomberg, the comment of getting more value for every rand spent when it comes to healthcare expenditure. Carol. Well, I, I've been interested that I don't think we've met Johnny's first requirement of looking at social value in this discussion. I actually think we're still a long way away from that. I think we're focusing on, on getting more value, but out of um, a, a limited group, a limited group of providers and a limited group of people, uh, be they patients, they usually are patients in the public sector. My second point is that I also think the challenge of shifting from services to episodes to patients to people to populations is a journey that we're probably only at the beginning of. And um, I think my, my third point is that um, to get leadership and an acceptance of accountability to to people, to persons, um, is, is this isn't going to be just a purely technological, it's not, it's not a technological fix. It's going to take some vision and bravery to actually move, to, to make that leapfrog, to make that, that jump. Stavros. Thanks, Bronwyn. I, I'm not going to state the obvious things like uh, the trust, you know, bridging the trust deficits and uh, putting the patient or the, you know, personalizing things, uh, pa placing the patient at the center. I think the one sort of overarching comment I wanted to make, it should be possibly haven't discussed in as much detail on this panel, is you, you've still got this, this disparity between the public and the private sector. And a lot of the resources sitting in the private sector, the volume sitting in the public sector. And where we felt quite dismally as a country, and if we're running a business, we wouldn't be running a very good business. We haven't leveraged the volumes that reside in the public sector. So I think we need to have a concerted effort at uh, you know, leveraging those volumes so we can get the economies of scale. Because I think one of the things we all agree on, certainly when we spoke earlier, is there's a lot of inefficiencies and we're not optimizing productivity. I think we've got to find sort of that magic formula that's gonna last to tap into those volumes and uh, m sort of uh, tapping into those volumes leads me on to my final point, which is we, we also shouldn't be too harsh on ourselves at times because there's actually a lot of things that do work in the country. You know, we're quite critical often as South Africans, 
So, you know, let's take what works and the good things and see how we can leverage those with the public sector volumes and improve efficiencies overall. Thank you. Ryan. I'll end with the same four questions I started with earlier, uh, which I think are germane to this quality debate. We need to be disruptive uh, in order to leapfrog this quality agenda. Uh, it cannot be incremental change. And to do that, we need to do some big things. So the first question is, how do we start presenting publicly patient ratings and quality ratings of healthcare institutions? <coughs> A huge kudos and applaud to Kurt for his description of the reporting that they give doctors around their costs and quality. How do we work together with that kind of environment and the data we have to make that available to patients and to deal with the asymmetry of information that patients experience, as you described in your own experience? The second question is, what stimulus is needed to break down the silos, the fragmented solo-based practice, and to create team-based care? Uh, and we really need to, to do that collaboratively. The third is, uh, how do we collaborate on a single electronic health record? Um, how do we get a single record adopted throughout the industry that contains a full representative sample of a patient's data? And I must say, on our health ID system, uh, the comment was it's no good to have just a discovery system and nobody else's or multiple systems. We would happily share that system with our competitors uh, and with all the providers in the room. Uh, if we could find a safe and collaborative way to do so, we would happily do so. Uh, the fourth question uh, is one that you asked, and we must solve the, sol the answer of how we realign reimbursement away from volume-based reimbursement, fee-for-service, and move that towards value-based reimbursement, buying quality. And that data, that reporting of that public data, will drive a lot of that value-based reimbursement. Morgan. Yeah, I, I support the three speakers, so I won't repeat what they said. Um, I think generally the consensus is that we endorse the need for value-based mm. reform. We have to do it. So we've got to embrace, there's going to be new initiatives, there's going to be new models, there's going to be new ways of doing things. I think, unfortunately, uh, people uh, must be taken through this journey because it's a challenge to them. Um, I also think in our attempt to look at person centricism, we, we're going to arrive at population health care. It's going to happen one way or the other. Uh, we in the IPA Foundation are thinking about developing what we call a patient portal. Uh, not going to the advance that Ryan is talking about outcomes, but we think we'll take five or six huge diseases that patients have put in a portal where patients can go into this portal and find out for themselves um, mm. what's wrong with them so they can react to this. Similar to HEDIS in America. And I think the last thing is, for me, and I think where the discussion is falling apart, we need to find a solution for healthcare in South Africa. Not a private sector healthcare solution or a public sector healthcare solution. And I think we're not getting to the fact that healthcare is healthcare. And we all need to come together and find a South African healthcare solution. Good. Good. Thank you. Um, I don't have all the answers to Ryan's questions, but uh, what I do want to say is that we need a mindset um, of patients first, not patient centricity, because then providers will remain first. Uh, the United States went through this process. We visited the United States in October last year. They've moved beyond patient centricity. They talk about patients first because that changes the behavior of all the providers. Secondly, we need a concept of value-based care to be introduced. The way to do it is to measure outcomes, to measure quality, and obviously to manage cost, and not to look at these two in isolation. Thirdly, to be able to enhance value, we need to integrate the delivery model. The way to do it is to work with our supporting doctors, and we need the doctors to take clinical leadership. The hospitals can't do that. We need to empower our doctors to come to the table and to show the leadership that's necessary to optimize the key. And then fourthly, <coughs> if we follow that approach, I think we will develop a shared vision. We will align our interests. And at the end of the day, 
all of us will share the vision of putting patients first. Christopher. Yeah, look, I endorse what has already been said, but I, th I think the big challenge is how do we improve access mm. to quality health care for South Africans generally. And uh, clearly, though, I think the private sector has, a, has an important role to play, and we need to find mechanisms of uh, making private health care more accessible to more people. And I think uh, using technology uh, to assist us is, is going to be absolutely key. The um, patient uh, electronic health record uh, across one, uh, <clears throat> one system for the country is, is, is clearly the ideal. <clears throat> Payment arrangements have to change. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think the, you know, the private sector has a big role to play. Uh, the, one of the big problems we have is the, the private sector doctors are aging. We, we don't have that many young doctors coming forward. And uh, how do we persuade the older doctors to possibly change uh, because they just want to see out their careers as they are? Thank you all for the robust and engaging debate, and thank you for joining this Discovery Health Industry Roundtable, coming to you live from Johannesburg, South Africa.